And uh, that leads us neatly to our guest this morning. Welcome to our next guest, known for being a practicing criminal barrister, a broadcaster, Sunday Times bestselling author, mm. lots of more things besides. Not very few things he can't do. Rob Rinder, good morning, Rob. Nice to oh, see you. It's lovely to see you. It's so nice to be here. Great to have and you And listening here. to your heavenly lilt. You like an Irish accent, oh, It's just the best. Put it on scaffolding and we're talking marriage. <laughs> I hadn't heard that before. It's just the best. This is a great start to the interview, is yeah. it not? Okay, well, that's a good start anyway. Yeah. Uh, all pictures, no sound. Um, welcome to the top of the tower. Oh, thanks so much. Is, 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 we're at the top of the... We are literally at the top of the tower. Look out the window there and you can Looking see Looking at the uh, melange that is London. Yeah, that's a great word for it, isn't it? Because you've got the, the, the Tower of London mm. and then you've got the Shard. It's got everything, hasn't it? It's, it does have it. It's a higgledy-piggledy sort of buffet. Yeah. It's sort of not one thing. It's like a herring pizza, but it sort of somehow works. <laughs> that's it. That's what they. That's what they're going to sell it now in the tourist yeah. board. Um, you're a busy man uh, because you've got you've got your new book out, mm-hmm. The Suspect, and you've got a TV show which I'm really interested as oh, well to so. talk about. Um, and wh- where is your your legal career these days? Where, where, where oh, that's you? a good question. So I'm still a full member of my chambers, which means yeah. you know I still have a, a room there, and I teach a little bit, and I care about championing the work of barristers and helping the public better understand you know what uh, lawyers do especially yeah. lawyers who represent uh, the least powerful so i try to carry on doing that work obviously i can't do jury trials anymore yeah. because it wouldn't be fair you know people need to be able sitting on juries and clients and victims to have confidence that people are focusing on the evidence rather than worrying halfway through a speech whether or not he would have given me a well they would have given me a 7 in the chacha yeah yeah me. exactly so, so so your fame if you want to call it that of celebrity precludes you from doing certain work. I'm doing jury trials, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but nevertheless, I can helpfully and I hope sometimes quietly advise and assist people. And the best thing about being a trained lawyer is it gives you some of the tools to help uh, people that might not have access to power. And uh, that's the thing I guess I, I care most about, really. In the last minute, you've referred twice to people who don't have a voice. I'm intrigued mm, by that. Where, yeah. where does that come from? Is that your own background? Is that a sense of seeing unfairness? In it? Yeah, I think everyone probably you love and everyone listening feels the same way. You know, um, but in my case, uh, I, I suspect the sort of impulse to stand between the individual, let's say, and the state with all of its power came yeah. from my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, mm. you know, came to this country with a temporary visa, pretending to be a child, having survived the war. His four sisters and his brother was were murdered. And as he was renewed, not in a city like London, where you'd expect people to be more used to, you know, a young Jewish kid, it, it was um, in... Windermere and consequently he found a deep and rich passion for democracy under the rule of law and it cut across rudely but no, the Windermere right. children are obviously sure. iconic and legendary but Absolutely. for those who don't know would you just briefly explain yeah so um, 735 children they're called the boys but there were girls amongst them too so a thousand that were offered temporary emphasis temporary visas having survived the holocaust uh, and they came here um, having experienced the most unimaginable unutterable hell mm. into as they described, the heaven of Windermere. And um, that was where they convalesced and found uh, a new family amongst themselves, having lost parents and brothers and sisters, and went into the world with optimism and courage alongside one another, rebuilding a family amongst each other. And in fact, the organisation, the 45 Aid, as it's called, is used as an educational tool and a global family. And my mum runs that organisation. I'm really proud of her too. She's still working away at that? She sure is, And tell me a bit about your mum. She sounds like a really interesting lady in her own right. She sure is. What's her name? Angie, hello. Well, she's mum, isn't she? I don't call her Angie. I'll Actually, call her Angie, yeah. I always call my mum um, Marjorie and Bob for some reason. I just, <laughs> it just feels, you know, the least likely thing for her to be called. So tell me about her. She um, is and was extraordinary for her time, you know, a uh, single mum. Mm. Who, you know, firstly, when our, my parents divorced when I was little, you know, really had a... A deep understanding, a sense, an intuition, because divorce was still shrouded in shame at that point. We're talking that, about the you know, early 80s, early 80s yeah. that um, it mattered to uh, try and keep conflict at arm's length from us and to enable and empower my relationship with my dad, for example, and his family to endure, which means, you know, it's been a real gift sort of growing up. So I'm very close to my dad's family too. But above yeah. all else, in her case, she had to make a living and so started a small business, right, um, from the top floor of our two 
into up house and became a, an extraordinary success. In what? What was she doing? She did desktop publishing. You've got to remember right. this is before the internet, so this yeah, is back she, in the day. She, she was ahead of her time. Oh right? yeah, well all the local newspapers, you know, were very important. She worked out that um, you know she could keep the advertising revenue, she could keep local newspapers going. But this was a time when you know she'd uh, arrive at a business meeting, they'd, they'd negotiate with the taxi driver until she'd walk in and uh, yeah. announce herself. You know, that's yeah, the I thing. Love her, yeah. Pioneering, full of elbow, yeah. shoulder pads, and thanks to Cher's pioneering efforts, now looks like. My sister, <laughs> which is good as well. <laughs> I had to keep up with you there. Suddenly, Cher <laughs> arrived. Into you the get studio. the point. I get the point. I <laughs> it's an amazing thing. I'm, you know, we keep going. Or whenever we go out, yeah. you know, I, it's one of those things. We're out at a table, and uh, the. I mean, they're not even being kind or uh, uh, disingenuous or generous, I suppose. Yeah. But when the waiter does, what would your sister like? There does come a moment. <laughs> I think it's time to stop, Mum. <laughs> she doesn't, obviously. Yeah? She's happy with the reaction. Let me ask you. Then yeah. I suppose that's that's intriguing. That, that yeah. what 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 your intergenerational trauma. You've heard mm-hmm. this expression, I'm sure, sure, many times. We have it in Ireland in a different story with the famine, yeah. which saw a lot of millions of people. Famine and the, and the troubles and, and the troubles. So well. it, it gets into the bone do you believe it gets into the bones i mean well we, uh, and yeah. travels of course it does we yeah. know it does we know it scientifically we know it emotionally so your uh, your fight for justice for the unheard or mm-hmm. in, you talk about your mom being a single mom mm-hmm. and, and and battling away and also yeah. being a woman battling a sure. very very uh, what, a patriarchal world as it yeah. was then still is a bit uh, people would argue it's more than that but that's mm. for another day so there's a lot there in in your uh, dna isn't there yeah, I mean, it's um, that's true in my case, but I'm going to make it more universal, I yeah. think. You know, I think um, we all, all of us, all humans, from as young as we're able to understand the language around us, we also pick up on the emotional uh, language around us. And it's a curious thing that young children have a deep understanding of justice and injustice. That's why little two-year-olds will, will cry when something mm. they can't articulate, mm. but they know it's fundamentally wrong. And I believe to my absolute core that people have more than an intuitive sense, a deep, in my view, and it's mine, and I suspect shared very widely, an almost spiritual um, sense that there is something called justice in the world. Mm. And it's often hard to define what it is, but we know when it's not there. What's right, what's wrong. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, we will talk about your book and your TV oh, show so. in a moment. Uh, but if that was really interesting. Just to get, oh. get a sense of who you are, and you've given us a very generously a uh, great sense of, of the person we're talking to today, Rob Rinder, joining us in Studio Live. We're going to take some music, and then we'll get back to What are we listening to? We're going to listen to uh, Republic are Ready to Go, which is, um, oh, right. you do know it. No, I don't. I'm like party like you, it's 1899. I conduct no, classical I, music. What is this I'm about? not far behind you, but tell me you don't know this. Go on. He knew the song, he knew the lyrics, he sang along, he just that sort of dancing to the thing. Rob Rinder, welcome again. Let's not go mad, I do like one little bit of it, but I didn't know what it was called. No, yeah, yeah. yeah I was, and I was kind of, we'll just wait till we'll get to the chorus, and then as soon as I got to the chorus, you were all over it. It's what's called a banger. It's a, <laughs> it's a banger. <laughs> now, we were talking during the song about how we're, so, I, I'm so lucky to have Connor and Meg here oh, to right. teach me. Hi, Connor and Meg. They speak, <laughs> they speak fluent youth. They speak young. Yeah, and oh, they no. teach, I speak pigeon youth. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, pigeon. Yeah. So, so together we make one, one, yeah, one exactly. fluent. One cool person. Uh, right, let's talk about The Suspect. Uh, this is oh, this, your second book yeah. uh, in, in, uh, in, in the series, I presume, mm. with Adam Green working mm. away and, and tra- traveling. We talked about your Jewish background. You talked about yeah. um, you know working class background. You talked mm. about a single mom and everything like that. Here we go with Adam, you know, I mean, yeah. there, there's there's shades of you in there. Talk to me about that's the book. Of, that's and, a lot of me And daytime there. TV, let's for enough forget. Right, right, right. I mean, it's so this is the second book. You don't need to have read the first, but uh, The Suspect starts with the uh, murder of a daytime TV star live on television. It looks like the chef has done it, but has he? <laughs> I love it. Now, I mean, it's obviously a um, an interesting, fun, dramatic premise for a book, but at the heart of it, exactly as you describe, is the life of a young barrister, mm-hmm. both in that and the first book, The Trial. Adam Green is loosely based on me. Um, and, uh, you know, you're talking about my early life. You know, I sound a little bit like, um, as George Bernard Shaw once said, you know, I'm sure you get that uh, on Virgin Radio every day. Every day. Uh, like branded 
on the tongue. People assume because you sound posh, yeah. you must be a certain thing. But I often think that people sound like me are just, you know, a thick person's version of what an intelligent person sounds like. <laughs> to try to be, uh, you know, this is but, a creation. But you, I was going to ask you, 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 mm. you weren't born with this accent. No, I grew you? up in Southgate around the corner from Amy Winehouse and, my, you know, up the road from Rachel Seas. People don't sound like me. I, this was a, a cultivated choice. Uh, I love your from, honesty to, about that. I, I don't well, hear that very... Right. If so, you're full of artifice. You no, know, I mean, it wasn't new. I've looked for, you know, uh, recordings of me when I was younger to see if I didn't sound yeah. like somehow I was related to minor royalty. But no, I mean, I just grew around people knowing I was different and thought, well, I better sound different too. It's partly because I was gay, but also because... You know, the people I was surrounded by, I thought, well, I don't really share any of your interests. I need to go and become this thing. Intriguing. So how do you go about becoming posh or sounding posh? It's very conscious. I just sort of, you know, would listen to radio and determine or curate my the things that I was interested in, in in a way that was oppositional from everything else other people were interested in. It's a sense of, a really strong sense I've always had of being um, contrarian, but not in a boring way, in a way that I really, you talk about your young producers, I care about for everybody, that nobody gets to write your story or conscript you into a narrative. You hold the pen um, to write the content of your own chapters. And so... You know, Adam Green um, is loosely based on me, a working class kid that went to sort of good universities and ends up in the rarefied world of chambers. Yes. Always feels a little bit like an imposter. Um, and you have this sort of who done it at the heart of it, which people have really enjoyed. But the subplot, both in this and in the trial, are based loosely on real cases that I've done and the Lovely. impact, especially that um, class, let's say, has on people's experience of the justice system. Wow. And so it's all, it's underwritten, it's a crime story, but underwritten with the mm. truth. Yeah. Uh, even if it's fiction and a truth that's born out of uh, societal uh, mm. observations and yeah. legal mannerisms sure. right. and all these things that, right. that, that, uh, Inform, yeah. have informed your life yeah. to date. Right, and also behind the kind of velvet drain pipes of uh, chambers. Yeah, we're not far across the road. It looks like an Oxford college, but, you know, uh, the temple where we're sitting here it looks pretty much like the 18th century. It hasn't changed that much besides. So we get to lift the lid, go behind the curtain of what happens in that rarefied world. If you were going to look for pomposity and mm. a certain degree of snobbery and yeah. definitely a rarefied accent, you've, yeah. you, law is probably the good place to be because it and I say this okay I see you're, you're yeah. frowning at that but I will I a do bit, say a bit. but the the, 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 the pomp and ceremony the, the, mm. the, the, I know the wigs are probably half, half gone now but no they're still there in are crime they, are they still there? yeah and they work in crime they don't listen they don't happen in other courts it's partly because it takes the experience for people who are you know, it, it's a really profoundly important moment whether somebody's, when we're, excuse me, assessing whether someone's liberty should be taken away. Yeah. So people wearing wigs and gowns does two things. First, I used to prosecute and defence. There's a sense of disguise separates me from the job, but also it takes it into this other world outside of people's ordinary lived experience. Well, it's scary, though, because you're somebody who mm-hmm. likes to make the law accessible. Yeah. That sort of stuff scares people like me off when you go into a courtroom you mm. see all that's like Ugh, it's very intimidating well I must emphasize you know if you're a vulnerable witness there are various things that can be done so for example uh, you know if you're cross-examining children unscreened. or other vulnerable but it can be on screen and also wigs are taken off and so on and so forth okay. but for, I didn't know that, yeah okay. but generally speaking I think that sort of sense it's not about theater it's about coming into a space that is wholly different bearing in mind the sanctity and how important mm. truth is that you go into this world that's wholly different from anything you might have touched before. Yeah, that I, just I, I, might I, elevate I, the whole experience to some extent. I think that's why the wigs, I think, work and are important. It's funny but it's not pompous, though. No. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, so I, I was thinking if we were in an Irish studio in yeah. context, I would ask you, yeah. I'd say you, could, you could equally have switched that last conversation with not law, but but church oh. you could have been a pre- like it's that's all costumes oh, and ceremony anyway maybe. let's talk about your TV that's show not why, that's not why I did it <laughs> no I know really. that no, I didn't do it just to sort of wear the wig uh, this I understand although once I mean I was doing a very serious murder trial as if there are unserious ones and I'd um, been on holiday and tried some um, orange tanning stuff and I I came outside and I'd put on a lot of weight back then because I was doing back to back trials and somebody did Think that I was Lumpa Lumpa. No, yeah. no, no, that's not that's nice. Quite, that's quite a moment. <laughs> self, self, self realization. Britain behind bars beginning this yeah. Sunday at nine o'clock on Channel Four. And again, this is this sounds intriguing. The lives yeah. of inmates going back centuries, yeah. petty crimes, notorious gangsters, brutal regimes. Right. I mean, the prison 
itself as a building yeah. it tells its own story and the evolution of that building exactly. and those who run it is that, yeah. is that that's exactly coming? it yeah. so I'm really proud of this work and it took some time to make and we finished it uh, last year so three prisons each of the prisons are exploring a different theme Dartmoor long term yeah. life sentences um, Shepton Mallet short term sentences and Shrewsbury the death penalty and we go back 200 years and there are a number of themes but in a nutshell it's the most curious thing that we're dealing and tackling with such an important social Social issue, issue that impacts all, all of us and we've been doing the same thing over and over again for 200 years experimenting with the same thing expecting a different outcome and it's fascinating to go back into the lives of people that served there and what difference things could have been what which which, which prison uh, was hmm. what struck you as the most there are so interesting i mean all or, of them have their own okay, different complexion um i mean dartmoor when you think about long-term sentences the fact that there were two riots there you know ultimately listening and hearing the people who have served time in there whose lives have been changed mm. And, you know, I get it. It's really hard to make a case for why prison shouldn't just be awful, you know, especially when, you know, people have been the victims of serious crimes. But when you speak to victims, especially um, victims, families who have visited prisons or anybody that's been inside a prison, they are always in every single case forever changed. They change their mind about what prison should be. Yeah. They don't want anybody else to be a victim. They know that the person who's responsible for the crime against their family or them um, often is somebody that um, has been thrown in the bin in life, that can't read, that might have learning difficulties or drug addiction. And if we do nothing about them, what happens to that person that becomes our neighbour? And I think that's something we're exploring. But it's not just activists, because I changed my mind a little bit in the course of the Did journey. Really? Of this yeah, I mean... I've talked about it a little bit, but Shrewsbury Jail, we talked about the death penalty, which obviously we don't have anymore. And I'm a, I am teach and uh, I'm involved in sort of activism, let's say, about trying to share with people and always listening and being mindful about why I think the death penalty is always wrong and bad. Yeah. The state should never have the power to take away somebody's life. But then there comes a moment or came a moment where I was listening to the voice of Pierpoint, who's the last ever hangman. Yeah. We can listen to his recordings. And uh, there was a moment where... Um, towards the end of the filming, I came into a room and uh, I pressed play and it's his voice. And it turned out, and I promised not to read ahead, that Pierpoint uh, was appointed after Nuremberg. Those were the trials that tried uh, the Nazi war criminals. Yes, yes. He, because um, the Americans uh, who had been uh, tasked, let's say, with the executions, didn't know what they were doing and couldn't do it in a sufficiently humane way. So there was Pierpoint. I pressed play and I hear his voice and he says... Uh, and I did 13 on that day. And he said, I did them two by two because I wanted to have my supper. And he says, it's the only time I hear him speak like this, I would have done that again. And then I have a little glass of scotch and the director says, turn over the piece of paper. And bear in mind at this point, I have a strong, you know, a, a deep, you know, sometimes our ideas are exactly this, but our views about the world sit in the spiritual hemisphere of our brain. They certainly did for me. A strong view against the death penalty. I turn over this piece of paper and look down at the 13, and one of them was a commandant of the concentration camp, of the man um, who personally tortured my own grandfather. Good Lord. And you think about that moment when Direct looks up at you with all of that activism, all of that confident view about the world, and she says, and well, what do you think now? Now, my view hasn't changed, but what I do know is that this is a complex issue yeah. that we need to reflect on. Nuance. Right, Nuance. exactly. Somebody, I think, once said, tyranny is a deliberate removal of nuance. And, you know, we need to be much more mindful and be able to sit more comfortably alongside complexity, don't you think? Oh, I, I, I think we could do another hour of, oh, of, of a do. chat. We could keep going, Rob. I just I, want to listen to you, actually. No, 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 far from it, Rob. Uh, gosh, that was so profound and so interesting. And we, we might do it again another time. What's our next song? Uh, the next song, we're going, to have a, we're going to take a little break. Oh. Let me remind people that your book is called The Suspect. Oh, The out Suspect, now, yeah. Britain Behind Bars, Sunday at 9 on Thanks. Channel 4. The next song we're going to have is pro probably Lewis Capaldi, I'm sure you know. You yeah. do. Okay. <laughs> Is that someone to love? Someone to love? Yeah. I know.